Do I have anything else to do, Don? Oh, do I have to preach? There is that. So, but enough for the other stuff. Um, let's see. Let's just pray for a minute. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight today. Amen. The uh, scripture that we're going to look at today, and it's a little bit bigger than just this section, but it reminds me of a song that I grew up with when I was growing up in a traditional denomination. And it was called Go to Dark Gethsemane. Go to Dark Gethsemane, you who feel the tempter's power. Your Redeemer's conflict see. Watch with him one bitter hour. And that, is a, that was a song, as I'm looking at the section of Scripture, which is before us, and I realized, wow, there was a real message in it, because it says, turn not from his griefs away but learn of Jesus Christ to pray. And so today, we're not turning away from his griefs. We're walking with him on the path of his passion. In many real ways, as we see Jesus uh, approaching the time when he would be in the garden, um, as we see the experience that he was having, having, the real battle, the real struggle that he had to overcome happened there. After that, he would walk through whatever happened. But he had to come to grips with the things that were coming against him, the cup that he had to drink. So, last week we talked about the fact that, you know, through the eyes of Judas, we were watching the fact that Judas had sold Jesus out out of bitterness at being rebuked because Jesus clearly rebuked him for coming against Mary when she anointed him. And he was greedy, and now that money wasn't going to be put in the purse, so he needed to find money someplace else. And he came up with the scheme to turn Jesus into the religious leaders, and they were happy to give him his silver coins so that he would betray Jesus. And then we saw how Jesus made sure Judas did not get an opportunity to betray him until after the Passover meal. The Passover meal was too important. And so Jesus protected it. He protected it to the point that when the disciples, he, he, he would have had the preparations for the Passover meal as most pilgrims arranged long in advance because Jerusalem became a very busy place during the Passover. And so the Passover meal he was going to celebrate with the disciples was certainly a time when, I mean, when he would normally have had it prepared way in advance, but if he had had it prepared way in advance, G- Judas would have known where it was. And so instead, the disciples had to come to Jesus. And this is probably very unusual and say, Lord, where are we supposed to prepare the Passover? I mean, it's only two days away. And Jesus said, well, hey, tell, or no, it was actually the day of at that time. And uh, so Jesus said, well, just go into the city. And when you go into the city, you're going to see a guy carrying a water jug, you know, a water pitcher. And you follow him and you say to him, hey, the master wants to know where the, where, where we're pre- the room is that we're going to celebrate the Passover. The guy will take you right there, and that'll be where we celebrate it. And Judas is thinking, my goodness, I can't, I can't report anything. I can't tell them where we're going to be having Passover. That's the perfect quiet time to arrest Jesus. But Judas could not figure it out. And then during the meal, Jesus reminded the disciple that one of them would betray him. And it, at a certain point, John asked him who, and Jesus said, the one I'm going to dip this bread in the bowl and give it to him. That's the one. And we're told in the book of John that as soon as Jesus, or Judas received it, Satan entered him, which means that Satan wanted to make sure that nothing would get in the way, that Judas would not have any second thoughts. And Jesus said to him, what you are about to do, do quickly, and he left the meeting. Now, to begin his betrayal, which means, by the way, Jesus was on the clock because Judas was going to go get the temple guards and come back to where they were. And so Jesus only had, from the time that Judas left, he had a set period of time, and then they had to vacate the premise, otherwise they would have been arrested there because certainly Judas was going to bring them back right to the place that he knew that he was. So 
We are at the place now where Judas has just left, and Jesus is about to institute something which we now call the Lord's Supper. We are in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and blessed it. He broke it, and when he had given it to his disciples, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then after he took the cup and blessed it, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, everyone. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will most certainly not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it with you in a new way in my Father's kingdom. So this is, there's a lot here. You understand, we could spend the rest of the day on just what is right here. But we need to move along for the purposes of, well, we need to get more of the Bible done. Got to get more of that into our souls and spirits. But um, it was while they were still continuing the Passover meal. And if you've ever studied the Passover meal, you know, you know it's very ritualistic. I wouldn't trust just about anything told you about the Passover meal today. I'd get sources about 2,000 years old. I wouldn't trust the you know, current stuff that's going on. And you say, what do you mean by that? I mean stuff happens. 2,000 years of history adds a lot of tradition. And so you want to find source documents from even before the time of Christ to find out what was Passover meal like. I've got one source document. It's called the book of Deuteronomy. Um, So, I mean, just don't get carried away with everything that people say about what happened at the Passover meal because most of that stuff has been just built on and built on and built on. We do know, though, that they had a lamb with bitter herbs and they had bread without leaven. And, of course, uh, any good Jewish meal, you'd have wine served, usually cut between three and ten times with water. And, you know, the idea that they somehow had grape juice just doesn't work. They didn't have the ability to do that, number one. I mean, they, they making grape juice was, I mean, all it takes is a little bit of fermentation to get in, a little bit of stuff, and it's going to it's gonna go bad. <laughs> and that bad is the wine, so, um, which they were quite used to drinking. So anyway, After he had identified Judas, while they were eating, he institutes the Lord's Supper. Now, as you read the different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's one account that makes it look like Judas might have still been there, but I think that's Luke's account, and Luke kind of jumps around by subject matter in the middle of the meal. Okay, so whether Judas was still there or not, it appears he wasn't from the book of John and that he had left. It would make sense that he had left because Jesus is about to do something very intimate with the disciples, and he does not want Satan, who is sitting there in the meeting, to disrupt it. So, he has already dismissed Satan, we believe, or Judas, Satan in him. And uh, during the Passover meal, he, in the Passover meal was, you know, like I said, a whole pattern was being gone through, and prayers and blessings were being said. And then he said to them in the middle of it, he took a loaf of bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and blessed it and he gave it to them and said, drink from it, everyone. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured on behalf, poured out on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. So the body given, the blood poured. Again, just to discuss the different ways that denominations take these words would take 10, 15 minutes. I'm not intent on doing that today. We do have a foundations course where we go through the different views. My goal simply today is to say, what did these disciples experience? Well, they certainly experienced Jesus instituting something new. He, Jesus was commandeering the meaning of the Passover and saying, I am replacing the Passover. He was the Lamb of God. He was the one who was about to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. He was the Passover lamb, and he says, now I'm giving Passover a new meaning. And in the same way that the Israelites put blood on the door frames around their homes in the same way that they did that, you are now going to put my blood around the door frame of your heart, and there's going to be a Passover, the angel of death will pass over you and pass over your household. 
And that's, that's what he was doing. He was co-opting the meaning of Passover, and he had the right to do it as the Lamb of God. Passover prophesied the, about the very weekend in which they were involved. The law prophesied Jesus Christ. And so Passover was a prophetic word about Jesus. And so his body was given, his blood was poured, um, the words, we call them the words of institution. This is my body given for you, broken for you, some of the, the scriptures. And the idea is, is that it was going, he was giving his life. His body would be broken, not in the sense of that there were bones broken, because we're told specifically that did not happen. However, his body stopped working. In that sense, it was broken because the life was being taken from it. Now, he eventually gave up his own life. He breathed his last. He said, Father, here's my spirit. But the blood was poured. Uh, very important in Exodus 24, 8. Mo this is obviously what's being referred to when Jesus is saying it. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Then he said, look, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has cut with you with all these words. And he was talking about the covenant which God had instituted with Israel. By the way, you always cut a covenant. That's the way it is. They, the way that covenants were norm. that's why there was blood involved. They would cut an animal, cut the animal, and institute the covenant. There's this one scene where Abraham is having this vision of God after he had cut some animals in half. And then he has this major vision that God gives him 400, the 400-year history of the people of Israel and beyond. And the, uh, but that started with an animal cut in half to demonstrate the covenant that Abraham and God had together. That's just the way it worked. You cut covenants. You didn't institute them. So Yahweh, by the way, is the, uh, God's first name. And uh, I usually, when I'm translating, will translate it Yahweh because God felt it was so important that he, when he was speaking to Moses, he says, hey, Moses, I didn't introduce myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Yahweh, but I'm introducing myself to you as Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, and yet not leaving the guilty unpunished, punishing the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you, no, I shouldn't say blah, blah, blah. It's scripture, but... Um, God talking. It's Yahweh talking. Sorry, Lord. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the, the picture is the Lord says, I'm going to introduce you by my name. Now, if God felt it was important for Moses to know him by name, don't you think it's important for his people? We know the name of Jesus, but we know the Father's name too. And so it's important that I, I believe, that's why I won't translate it like the other Bibles do, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's, uh, I don't know what that is. That's, a, that's, that's an attempt to not offend Jewish people who aren't going to read the Christian Bible anyway. I don't understand it, but we do it that way. So it, it's called the Tetragrammaton, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. But I'm always going to translate it Yahweh. Sorry, that's an excursus, but I needed to say it. Um, God gave us his name, so it's important, I think, to use it. So don't misuse it. When we, you know... If we're not using the name of Yahweh because we're afraid of misusing it, then Jesus you shouldn't be using either. Is that correct? Okay, I'm just saying. Okay. You can say anything as long as you say just saying. Okay. So anyway, here's the blood of the covenant that Yahweh cut, and he sprinkled the blood. That's what Jesus was doing. He was offering his, he was saying, here's, here's, here's the sprinkling for you guys. It's not going to be external. You're going to drink this as a sign of cutting the covenant with me. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 had spoken about that covenant. Look, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. For this is the covenant I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in them and write Write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will never again remember their sin. That's the new covenant. Okay, that's the new covenant that was being cut, and it was being cut in Jesus' body, obviously, as he would be damaged for it. 
But the, it's the promise of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I shortened it, of course. You can see the ellipsis is in there simply because it's a much longer section of Scripture. But I pulled out the ones that really speak about the essence of the covenant that we have together. And it's a covenant where the Holy Spirit indwells us and God forgives our wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's an amazing covenant. That's what we live under. This was prophesied by Jeremiah, and he's probably looking at it going, this is amazing. And then Jesus initiated it, and we live under it and need to appreciate it, you know, and quit, quit doing those legalistic things which try to bring us back under the old covenant. It's amazing how many people that have the brand new covenant still want to live under the old covenant. And I'm talking about Christians. You expect Jewish people to want to live under the old covenant. It was their covenant. But Christians who have a new covenant suddenly say, you know, I need to find my Jewish roots. Your Jewish roots are found in the book of Romans. By grace, okay? Ephesians, by grace through faith. You know, it's, we stand on what they did by continuing to bring forth the Scriptures and the Messiah. That's our Jewish roots, but now we live in our covenant. We don't go back and try to dig out legalistic things we can live under. Okay, so I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. So the body given, the blood poured out, and then Jesus says something really important. He says, I say to you, I will most certainly not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it with you anew, in a new way in my Father's kingdom. NIV says, anew. And so I'm going, anew. And then I realize, oh, wait. Um, anyway, the, uh, this is a very specific time that Jesus is referring to. It's after he returns again. How do I know that? Because in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 25, he says he is going to remain in heaven. Paul says this about Jesus. He's going to remain in heaven. Then the goal, when he delivers over the kingdom to our God and Father, at the end, when all his enemies have been defeated, he's going to deliver over the kingdom to God our Father when he has nullified all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until the Father has placed all his enemies under his feet. Okay, so... Um, the Father doesn't get the kingdom until Jesus defeats every one of his enemies. And we defeat him for him, honestly, is what it's saying. But um, the Father's kingdom doesn't happen until Jesus consummates his kingdom. And then he hands it back to the Father. So this is a very specific statement. When Jesus says, I'm not going to you know, sit down and have this meal with you, or this wine, actually, he even says, I'm not going to have this with you until um, I hand over the kingdom to my father. Then there's going to be some feasting. Okay, I'm telling you, there'll be some of the best wine, and it won't be intoxicating. Okay? By the way, that was, a, that was how do we know that um, Noah demonstrates to us Noah a righteous man gets intoxicated after the flood meaning that things were changing far quicker than what he thought there was a whole change in the atmosphere and everything else going on and he was just going to have whatever he normally did I'm certain and it ended up being too much and gotten big you know well it's one of his grandsons got in big trouble over it but um the uh Wine that we're going to be celebrating with the Lord within the Father's kingdom is going to be refreshing and joyous, and mark my words, it's going to be a good time. Be there. Verses 30 and 32. After they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all stumble over me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So they sang a hymn. And again, as I already said, they, it was important that they leave before Joseph got back. Um, they did not sing, Go to Dark Gethsemane. But they sang probably a responsive psalm, something like that. But it is called a hymn. Then Jesus said to them, You will all stumble over me this night. And the Greek word stumble is that scandalizal thing. You know, it's a scandal happens. And it's the idea of it's the scandal is the trigger on a mousetrap. That's the scandal. It's the stick holding up the box, gets knocked out of the way, comes down. That's the scandal. And when you stumble, you're stumbling over a trigger that causes you to be trapped by some sin. 
So this is a very specific picture. Stumbled's the correct way to translate it, but it is still, you know, there's, it's a bigger picture. And so Jesus said, you are going to stumble over me this night, for it is written, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's Zechariah 13, 7. We don't need to go there because it says, strike the shepherd. and the it actually says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But Matthew truncates it a little bit. Um, so there's a prophecy that has to be fulfilled. And that prophecy said there's going to come a time that Jesus' followers, uh, he, he's going to be struck and the flock is going to be scattered. However, listen to the renewed relationship. He said, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Here's the promise. Instead of you guys, after what's about to happen, instead of you guys all slinking back to Galilee after this weekend, defeated with no hope, I'm going to get there before you. I mean, he's giving them assurances even before the events happen and before they have any understanding. And this is an incredible night that Jesus is having with his disciples. Don't think it's a short thing to begin with. It starts with Jesus washing the disciples' feet, John 13. I mean, this thing, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. There's a whole lot of somberness. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of encouragement. And so Jesus then says, listen, you're all going to stumble because of me. And so what does Peter say? In this grave moment of prophetic unction and power, Peter responded and said to him, if everyone stumbles over you, I will never stumble over you. Jesus said to him, I'm telling you the truth on this night before the rooster crows, you will deny that you know me three times. Peter said to him, if I must die with you, I will most certainly never deny knowing you. In a similar way, all the other disciples spoke the same way. Okay, now here's, I saw, I saw on Wednesday someone was walking a friend of mine through a process of logical reasoning to say, let's just test that last thing that you said by talking about the, what we know about the individuals involved. And it was pretty, actually pretty funny. This isn't funny, okay? Um, this is Peter saying to Jesus, you're wrong. Okay? This is Peter saying, I don't care what the Bible says. It's wrong. You understand why I put Peter's arrogance? Jesus, you're wrong, and the scriptures you're quoting are wrong. By the way, if those words ever come out of your mouth, you're in trouble. And what do I mean by that? Because God is so gracious, he's going to make sure that you understand fully just how wrong you are. And as we, I mean, we're going to get to that scene where Peter's going through this whole process, and then there's the scripture that says, and soon as the rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks right at him. Can you imagine? Okay, these words we're going to, I can't even imagine they haunted him till he departed this earth, probably, you know, when they were in his times that he'd let them haunt him. Because, you know, we're supposed to get over the sins that we do, and we're supposed to believe the Lord that they're washed and they're under the blood, and they're as far as the east is from the west. But there's that part of us where Satan is always the accuser trying to come against us and use it against us, and you have to get really good at putting up your shields right away and say, no, no, that's been forgiven by the Lord. And Peter had to do that exact same thing, because this was difficult. I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that we haven't done similar things. Because, you know, no sin has come upon you that it isn't just common to humanity. But I do know that this was something that um, was pretty arrogant. By the way, all the other disciples joined in the problem, you know. Peter, by the way, his, his statement was also an indictment of the other ones. Oh, well, all these other puppies might. In fact, I suspect especially that one will, right? Okay. All these other puppies might fall, but not me, Lord. And, you know, and that means so now it's intacting the integrity of the other disciples. And uh, he led them into this situation. Uh, Peter didn't know his own flesh, okay? And, and, and nor did the others as they all, they heard what Peter said and they went, well, we've got to say the same thing. Now, by the way, what they were saying is, Lord, I know you said this and you've never been wrong. 
but you're wrong this time. Okay, now that, here's what was happening. It was such a shocking statement to them, they had to put up their defenses. Okay, they psychologically could not handle this because it was overwhelming. The idea that they would run from the one that they loved, that they had been through much, so much with. They had no idea the darkness that was about to be released on the earth, how the hordes of hell were going to be attacking and how they were going to wilt in the barrage of it. They had no idea. This was a supernatural evil night. This was not a normal night. There are times that we can walk out, and you know this, There are times that we can walk out our door, we can walk out wherever we are, and we have the boldness and confidence of a lion, and we are walking, and we know demons are fleeing from us wherever we go. And there are other times that we, because of what's going on in the atmosphere and everything around, and maybe because we had bad pizza, I don't know. But you walk out that same door and you're going, good night, what happened to this atmosphere? And you can feel terror trying to press in. And you say, what happened? What changed? Well, you know, the atmosphere changed. Satan might be doing something. But the other thing is, is that you didn't gird up your loins really seriously (laughs) before you stepped out that door because you didn't know what you were stepping into. Jesus told these guys how to get through this. They slept through it. Oh, yeah, that's coming. Verses 36 to 39. Then Jesus arrived with them at a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be distressed and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very distressed, even to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. When he had gone a small distance, he fell upon his face, praying, and said, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass by me. However, do not do as I desire, but as you desire. So, Jesus, with full knowledge of what is coming, finds it necessary to pray. The disciples who have been told what's coming found it was necessary to sleep. Okay. Jesus needed prayer. He needed to connect with his Father in heaven. And it, you know, as he's praying that this cup pass from me, he had set his face like flint. The idea that he'd be wilting in the face of the beatings or the torture or the crucifixion doesn't sit right. But he was bearing the sins of the world, and as a result, the Father was going to turn his back on him. That's the cup. He's had full fellowship with the Father from the foundations of the earth, from before, sitting with the Father throughout eternity. And now, to redeem us, he and the Father were going to step out of relationship and fellowship. And he, because that's how the wrath was poured on him. And the idea of it was more than he could handle. And he fell on his face before his Father, and he said, Father, if it's possible, please, but not my will what you need, know needs to be done. This is, this is a deep, dark night of the soul, if ever there was one. Um, it says in, I think it's the book of John, that he was sweating so profusely from the struggle that his, blood, or that his sweat was like drops of blood. doesn't mean they were blood, but it was like drops of blood, which means capillaries may have been breaking through the tension of it all. So his struggle was against his will because who would desire to be separated from the Father in heaven? And he had to come to grips that this was something that they had agreed upon. It was prophetically necessary. And he had to strengthen himself in his relationship with his Father that he still had. And his trust in the Father was simply this. Whatever you think is best, I'll do. This is an amazing scene. Then he went to his disciples and found them sleeping. 
He said to Peter, so you did not have the strength to stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is ready, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, saying, My father, if it is not possible to have this cup pass by without drinking it, let your will be done. So, um, the disciples who had already said that they weren't going to abandon Jesus were so confident they didn't feel the need to pray. Now, I want to be fair to them. It was a full day. There was a big meal. There was wine. And there was grief. Lots of it. This is overwhelming stuff. Physiologically, their bodies would have been craving sleep. Emotionally, they would have been exhausted. And spiritually, they were too insensitive to know that there were reasons to trump this urge to sleep. And so they were asleep. They failed the first battle with the flesh. I'm not saying, by the way, any of us would have done any better. I mean, by the way, if you ever look at this scene and said, if I had been there, I wouldn't have done that, that's arrogance. Okay, yeah, you're just being Peter, right? So um, that is, that, that it, I mean, obviously, this is something that there was a spiritual onslaught on, on, unlike anything. They didn't even have the indwelling spirit to be able to help them yet. That wasn't going to come until Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit on resurrection Sunday night. So the problem wasn't with their spirit. Jesus said, the spirit is ready. You guys in your spirit, you're ready. You got a problem, though. The problem is your flesh needs to believe what your spirit believes. Your flesh needs to walk in the power that your spirit is walking in. And the way that they were going to connect those two things was through prayer. Aha, pay attention. How do you connect the power of your spirit to your flesh? One of the ways is through developing that relational prayer with the Lord and asking him to overcome those things. Now, Jesus said in the book of John, out of your belly will flow, liver, li- uh, will flow rivers, not livers, but li- rivers of living water. So out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. And the, uh, they did not have the Holy Spirit yet. Now we know, we are well aware of this, that um, we connect to the spirit realm in our bodies. Our spirits are about right here, okay, right about where the diaphragm is. And so when he said, out of your bellies, it's this area. He's saying, this is where you're going to sense the spirit flooding your body. And that's why when we pray out loud, when we project in song, we can begin to feel a response from the Holy Spirit in our bodies. If you can't feel that, work on it. I'm just saying, pray more. Ask the Lord to show you that. Okay? And because that is that's one of the ways that you pre- one of the ways that you prepare yourself for spiritual battle is by releasing that power of the spirit into your flesh so that you have more power than they did. Okay? I when I I go into tense situations once in a while and I just make sure that I'm spiritually a little bit in a better place than what I normally am just as I walk down around this world. I want to know that I'm saturated with the presence of the Lord so that my flesh doesn't get weak in the face of anything that I have to face. So the problem isn't the spirit. It's getting that spirit into the flesh. We have a great advantage. I'm just taking the application and saying, hey, they didn't have the spirit. They would pray and it would have helped them anyway. We've got the Holy Spirit indwelling us who just wants to get released into our minds and our emotions and our will and our physical bodies. And he certainly does sometimes. Okay. So problem wasn't their spirit. It was their flesh. And Jesus goes away another time, went away for a second time. He prayed, saying, Father, if it's not possible to have this cup pass by, your will. He's, you know, he's starting to, that acceptance thing was certainly happening. He just simply accepts it humbly. He says, your will, same thing he said the first time, just a little bit shorter and a little bit more direct, saying, you know, I, he's starting to understand. It's, Father's not changing the plan, so obviously something's, So he went again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again and went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same prayer again. 
Then he went to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest at another time. Look, the hour is drawn near, and the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, the one who is handing me over has drawn near. Okay, so they were failing with the second struggle <laughs> against the flesh. They, weren't, they were not three strikes, you're out, right? So um, Jesus walked back, saw that they were asleep again, went and said the other prayer. And uh, then there's this, it's an odd phrase, um, and I'm not going to get into the grammar of it, but a lot of your translations have a question where it says, Jesus simply says, are you sleeping and taking your rest and is still? Except the Greek word doesn't mean still. It means in the future, which means it's not a question. He's making a statement. He's saying, sleep and take your rest in the future at another time. Right now, things are happening. So he's waking them up. And he's saying, guys, wake up. Judas is here. And things are about to happen. So Judas had finally found them. Again, he probably went to the upper room first. There might have been several other places that Jesus had been taking the disciples throughout the week. So Judas could not figure out his pattern. And so Judas is probably going one place after the other after the other with the troops until he narrows it down and he gets to Gethsemane. Now, by the way, when you think of Gethsemane, the chances of it being the place they show you when you're in Israel is like about zero. However, it was close, okay? And it may even overlap it a little bit, okay? But what it looks like today would be nothing like it. None of the trees were around then. Um, the, uh, but it was, more than likely, it was an enclosed garden with one entrance. And Jesus may have left the larger group of disciples outside the stone wall and then brought the three inside into this little enclosed area. And uh, that's where he had his prayer time. And now all of a sudden, we've got the situation where Jesus sees the torches coming. And he knows what that represents. And he says, Judas is coming over. The one who is handing me over is here. While he was still speaking, indeed, Judas, one of the twelve, approached him. And there was a large crowd with him, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and elders of the people. The one who was handing him over had given them a sign, explaining, the one I kiss is the one. Arrest him. He immediately approached Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, for this you have come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. So it was a mob from the leaders. There may have been some soldiers there from, from uh, Pilate. You know, uh, Pilate was usually involved in keeping the peace. And if they would have come to him and said, hey, we just want to make sure things get out, get out of hand. We're going to arrest the teacher. Pilate would have been happy to send a small detachment to follow along just to make sure things stayed in order in case there was a riot or whatever, um, especially if they're going to arrest him in town. And so uh, the book of John makes it sound like there may have been Roman soldiers there. But again, it's, it's not a big part. They were only there as kind of backup. Um, but the rest of it is, it, it, here it's fairly clear that it was a mob. I mean, they came armed with swords and clubs. And they were sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Um, and Judas had a sign that he was going to mark him. Now, you have to understand, um, they didn't have cameras back then. Charcoal sketches probably weren't very helpful. They were used to seeing Jesus in the daytime moving around the temple, but it now was dark and there were shadows and it was by torchlight. And it would have been difficult because people can look like, you know, themselves. And it would have been difficult to identify him. So you needed someone who absolutely knew. And so Judas arranged the most perverse sign you can imagine. Because the kiss was a sign of friendship a sign of camaraderie, greeting, and love. And so he came walking up to Jesus, and he said, watch, I'm going to not kiss any of the other ones, but the one I kiss, you're going to know it's him. And so he walks up, and he gives him a kiss on his cheek in greeting. And Jesus just looks at him and said, you came to give me a kiss? Because it's such a perverse way. It's not just, here he is, that's bad enough. But it's like he piled even more 
on his betrayal. Remember, Jesus said that it would be better for this man who does this, that he would never have been born. And then he goes and he makes it even worse. And you wonder, my goodness. Uh, Satan, but remember, Satan had entered him, had hardened him against anything decent. So Jesus has this ironic question of Judas, and then they arrest Jesus. Now, as they arrest Jesus, you've got the disciples who are standing there, who are watching what's going on, and they're seeing the mob, and they're seeing the detachment, and you're thinking, what in the world are we going to do? And Peter moves unexpectedly. One of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Return your sword to its place, for everyone who takes up the sword will suffer loss by the sword. Or do you think that I'm not able to call upon my Father, and he will at once provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? Then how would the Scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Okay, so Peter, we know it's Peter. Peter moves quickly. By the way, there's a mob with swords and, and, and soldiers from the temple guard, at least. They had swords and they had everything. Uh, the disciples had two swords. Jesus had said at one point, hey, how many, in another one of the Gospels, how many swords do we have? They had two. That's enough. Two swords against a detachment from the temple guard and mob with clubs. This is uh, foolishness. Now, remember in the book of John, though, when they said, hey, we are seeking Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am he, and they all drew back and fell down. Matthew doesn't include that. We don't understand where it all fits with, with Judas's kiss, but um, we certainly, it was probably right after, um, but we do know they all fell down. Now, if you're Peter and you see all this, everyone around you fall down, your courage is kind of built up, don't you think? Jesus said, I am he, and they all, boom, hit the ground. And so Peter certainly might have felt he had an unfair advantage. He took a sword and he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. His name was Malchus. We're given that in another gospel. Um, if you think that Peter was looking to uh, cut off his ear, you are grossly mistaken. He was looking to kill him. He was taking a swing at his head. He was going to take this man out because he was one of the closest people to Peter. And so Peter was going to start by killing the closest person next to him. And this was not a night for killing. This was a night for the Lamb of God to carry out his purpose. And so Jesus steps in. By the way, Peter would have died right there. He would not have made it much further. And so Jesus said, I'm not, I, I will not lose any of mine except the one doomed for destruction. He had the other 11 under his personal care. And so Peter had just done something that put his own life at risk because of his impetuous arrogance. And so Jesus has to move quickly. If you always wondered, why did he heal Malchus' ear? It's because when he healed Malchus' ear, it shocked everyone. And Peter's life was spared because Jesus fixed it. And in authority, he said, put away your swords. Everyone who uses a sword like that's going to suffer loss. And what he was saying to Peter is, your life is hanging on a thread. Don't do this. So Peter put his sword away. And he says, by the way, I'm able to call my father. I've got angels at hand. I've got a legion of angels. That's about 6,000 angels, 6,000 men in a legion. So I've got I've got 12 legions, one for each of us. There's only 11 disciples now, plus Jesus. So I've got a legion for each of us. You don't think that that's enough to handle these guys? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Which I was talking to you about earlier tonight. And, you know, he was rebuking his disciples. Can you imagine the crowds watching all this going on? They're there to arrest Jesus, and Jesus is yelling at his disciples and healing one of their people. You know, if you're one of the people that were along, you're going, this is weird. This is really weird. Okay, this is like, he's, okay, they're trying to help him, and he's rebuking them. Uh, it, was, it, was an odd, it was an odd moment for them, and it needed to be an odd moment for them. They were involved in something really wicked. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with sword and clubs to apprehend me like you would a bandit? 
I was sitting with you each day in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this whole thing has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all his disciples abandoned him and fled. So he got done yelling at his disciples, and he yelled at the crowd. Think about it. So now they're getting yelled at. Can you imagine? This crowd had come out to arrest him. And he's, he's taking authority over them. This doesn't normally happen. When you've got people coming to arrest a bandit, that's who they're treating him like, you don't allow the bandit to lecture you. You take him into custody. He rebukes them and says, I was with you every day. However, these are orchestrated events. It's through the prophetic eye of God. Everything you're doing is in the scriptures. And this whole thing has taken place to fulfill them. And then the disciples stumbled. They all took off. That's, they just all took off. Those who had arrested, by the way, they needed to take off because otherwise they might have been arrested and they weren't strong enough to handle what was coming. How do we know that? Because they all ran away. That's a pretty good sign. And uh, even Peter ran away, but he followed at a distance. It says those who arrested, those who had arrested Jesus brought him back to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribal scholars and the elders had gathered. Peter followed him at some distance to the courtyard of the high priest. And when he went in, he was sitting with the servants to see what would happen. Now, we know he was with John. John had access. John knew the families of the high priests, of the chief priests. And so John had access. So Peter and John went. John had some level of protection because of that relationship. Peter had none. And so John was able to get him inside the courtyard because Peter couldn't have got inside the courtyard otherwise. Otherwise, but Peter was, I mean, you understand, he followed right into the lion's den. And he wanted to stay close to Jesus. Um, Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Annas was the deposed high priest. Caiaphas was his son-in-law, who was the nominal high priest, but everyone still would speak to bo both of them. And then the whole Sanhedrin was there, which means the ruling council of the Jewish people. And Peter was not going to let him out of his sight, not realizing what was going to happen. He was going to be put to the test. That's for next time. This uh, section of Scripture, walking the path with Jesus, walking his passion, um, reminds us of the things that he stepped through. He was stepping around one hurdle after another to get to his appointed purpose. He wasn't a victim. He had to work through the circumstances that presented himself so themselves so he would be able to end up where he needed to end up, sacrificing himself for the sin of the world. And so when we look at him voluntarily crying out to the Father in prayer, we see that it was a real struggle. This was not something that was just a charade. It wasn't a pantomime. It was real. The struggle was real. But what kept him going was the love of the Father and the fact that he knew that we were at the end of it. He deserves our love. He deserves our praises because he has, he, fil he, he followed through. He fulfilled it all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the fact that you did not have your disciples shy away from your own personal struggle. We understand separation from the Father we don't understand anything about it, honestly, but we understand that it was something that motivated you to ask that the cup would pass. I ask that you would give us a deep understanding of how much you cared for us. No wonder the book of Romans says, how will you, how will the Father, along with you, graciously give us all good things if he did not spare you and you did not spare yourself. I ask that you'd impress us with those things today so that it makes us understand the great privilege in which we walk as your disciples. Amen.